Hi, this is Brittany, and welcome to the Reclusive Blogger Interviews. On this episode, my guest is Tom LaFleur, a breakout solo artist and producer who you might recognize from his indie rock outfit, The Jacks. In this new project, he switches up his sound completely and crafts a soulful lo-fi pop sound that's filled with nostalgia and haze, an aesthetic that is anchored by groovy guitars and jazzy melodies. Tom's newest singles are Lie That You Love Me and If You Were To Leave Me, and they're off his forthcoming release, My Life, My Love, and My Fantasy, a release that draws from Tom's personal battles, music highs and lows, anxieties, navigating love and relationships, and much more. We discuss this and more ahead in this interview. I guess I like to start off and talk a bit about your background in music and then some of your prior work with the uh, your group, the Jacks. Okay. Um, well, yeah. So I started out playing music growing up, maybe around nine or ten. I first picked up the guitar and was super into classic rock and all the you know the big bands, Zeppelin, Beatles. Pink Floyd, Beach Boys, um, even like Sinatra, just kind of stuff that my parents were playing in the house. And I did that all the way until college. And in college, I actually decided to major in something else. I was a I was a business major in college and just played on played uh, guitar on the side. And towards the end of my college experience, I met a few guys and we started a band. And it was not called the Jacks at the time. It was called, I think it was the Lokers. It like it was a Weird name. Um, but we were the Lokers for a little bit, and then we were Blue Future, and then we were the Jacks. And I was doing the Jacks from probably 2016, 2015, 2016 until um, 2021. And during that time, we signed with we, we actually submitted our uh, one of our singles to this radio competition, KLOS Next to Rock. And got invited to play at the Viper room and we won this like record contract basically. And we showed it to the only guy that we knew in the music industry. And he's like, Hey, I wouldn't sign this because I'm actually starting my own record label um, under universal. And so we signed with him about a year later and <clears throat> kind of did the whole thing. We toured and, and recorded with Matt Wallace and Joe Ciccarelli and sunset sound, which is like a legendary studio. Um, and got the full band experience. We like toured for years and years and it was so fun. Um, but towards the end, we started to kind of like keep by each other's necks and it was just a lot. And um, we played our final show at the Fonda in October of 21. And then I had like maybe a year where I couldn't really figure out what I was doing in terms of music and non-music. Like I didn't really know what my place was. And during that time was like a lot of the, I feel like the foundation for this, this current solo album, just like questioning everything, you know, um, like your place in the world, like, especially for me is like, is, is music my hobby? Is it my career? Is it like this passion that I just have on the side? Like what role is it going to play in my life? And I was definitely questioning all of that. Um, and even if like, I'm just good enough to make music or whatever, all of the self-doubt that comes with that. Um, but yeah, the band was like a super formative period for me in terms of how to, you know, write and produce. And we ended up producing our whole, um, our whole last album. So like just going through the process of that was definitely the, the boot camp that I needed to like make my own music eventually. And I guess, um, I have a question kind of going off of that. Um, when uh how was touring for you i know a lot of people when they some people really really love it and then i know a lot of musicians um really they kind of hate it it's a grueling process so um was there aspects of the touring process that you really liked or was it i i guess did it kind of formulate how you will um see the well your solo making uh your solo music and uh, things like that. I would say that, yeah, the touring was, was fun for us because we were young and we were friends. And so it was just kind of like, you're just 
exploring with your buddies and you're playing shows and like all of that's so fun. The stuff that's not fun is like, you know, it's not super healthy. You're like sitting in a car for eight, nine hours a day. And then you go and you play a show and you're up late and you're usually drinking and you're kind of like partying a lot. So and you're sleeping on couches and like that I don't miss. Like as fun as that was in that period of my life, I'm not really trying to do that right now. Um, but I guess how that's like informed the solo stuff is towards the end of the band too. It's like, we didn't really, we stopped writing songs that we would, would, would translate live. And we just kind of started focusing on like what the record would sound like in the studio. And that's definitely translated to the solo stuff. Cause I'm not really concerned with how it's going to sound live yet. I'm all, you know, figure out that adaption in its own artistic way but I'm focused strictly on how like the studio record sounds where I'm not thinking, Oh, could I pull this off live with, you know, whatever instrument it's strictly for how it sounds in the record or on the record in that moment. Um, but I'll definitely tour the, the solo stuff, you know, especially if it starts to pick up traction, I think my focus right now is going to be on more digital, like social media, TikTok, just coming up with better songs, keep writing, getting better. And then as soon as there's like some traction, um, going out and touring that. And since you, uh, mentioned, uh, songwriting, I had, there's a question I have listed and how have you seen yourself evolve as a songwriter? I guess just kind of over the years. It's a great question. Um, it's definitely a skill that I feel like people are like, Oh, you, you're a songwriter. You're not a songwriter, but I, I really do think it's a skill that you can hone and get better at just like anything else. And I've found myself, you, you, your threshold for what you think is good just gets higher and higher. It's like the first time you ever write a song, you're like, oh my God, I wrote a song. Like, it's amazing. And then a thousand songs later, yeah. you're like pretty hard on yourself because it's like you just know what, like what, where the bar is. Mm-hmm. You know? And so I feel like just the process of writing over and over again, even in the band where I was like more of the guitarist producer, set the bar, you know, higher working with the singer mm-hmm. and the other guys on like, getting the best stuff and then recently just kind of on my solo journey it's like the same thing I I actually had to set the bar really low in order just to get the reps in out because I would I would try to write a song and I was like this isn't good enough and so I had to I had to be like okay it's okay to write like a whatever song just to keep that process going and then through the process of just writing you know maybe Mm -hmm. like hundreds of songs you get better and you get better and then the good ones come out pretty quick because you're just kind of more refined in that and you can pump them out quicker. So, um, yeah. And then also, I guess, kind of getting more relaxed with the process of writing and not being so hard on yourself and just kind of getting into the swing of things. Exactly. Yeah. You kind of get in that flow where you write enough songs and then you stop overthinking little, the little things. And that's like kind of the spot that you want to be in. And since you mentioned uh, that you were more in the guitarist producer kind of role in your band, um, how have you kind of taken that part into the making of the record? Yeah, that's interesting. Yeah, definitely. There's guitars on like every song. Um, And I almost feel like even I try to avoid falling in the trap of just like, oh, he's a guitarist, singer, songwriter, because I feel like there's so many of those. So I'll lean on the production stuff a little bit too, where it's like I'm trying to build out these soundscapes that are more even maybe inspired by like Dijon and Frank Ocean and like some even R&B artists that aren't really like what I was doing in the band. But I have just so much experience coming from the kind of indie rock, rock world that it inevitably just all blends together. Um, but yeah, most of my songs will start with me playing acoustic guitar in my room and figuring out a melody over that. And then once I like something that like I can record on a voice memo, then it goes into logic and I start building out this like world around it. Um, which I'm sure is how a lot of people work, but just coming from the guitarist producer role, I definitely like lean on guitar sounds and guitar parts and like how the production sounds, I would say just as much as the melody. Um, Because all of that is like important to me and I care about all of it. 
And I know you mentioned that this is kind of a different sound that you're going for on the record. Was that always something that you were, um, I guess, kind of insistent on doing? Or was it just something that kind of happened? It, I definitely, when I started it, I did not have a sound. Like when I started the solo stuff, I did not have a sound. I know that for sure because I was making all types of different music. I'd write like, an acoustic almost country-esque song and then write like a Rufus to soul like I want to make dance me music like I was all over the place because I didn't really know what I wanted to say as a solo artist and like who I wanted to be um and then I kind of found this like sweet spot I think between some of like the jazzy lo-fi-ness of Bruno Major being like a traditional songwriter yeah he's awesome um I was like oh I I, I kind of see a lane for myself there but I also still love, like, at that time, I was listening to so much uh, Frank Ocean and Dijon and Dominic Fike. And, like, yeah, like, those those productions don't sound like guitar, singer, songwriter so- songs. Um, and so I feel like it was just kind of inevitable based off of all the inputs I had of, like, it's a little bit indie rock. It's a little bit, like, lo-fi, traditional singer, songwriter. And it's a little bit of, like, that r&b like polish synthiness to it like i obviously don't sound like frank ocean but just like in my head i'm like oh that synth is like what maybe he would do at this one part you know where it just like informs like a small a small section of the song but to me it overall like adds to the the final product is there anybody that if you had a chance to produce for who would it be probably like dominic fike right now well, yeah, he he, cause he he yeah he kind of has that like, you know, maybe rap, but like more R and B soul, but then also like this like indie rock flair, where he yeah it's it's just like indie rock drums and like guitar parts and all that, but he's still coming at it from this like totally refreshing angle. Uh, so yeah, probably like Dominic Fike or honestly Post Malone. I think Post Malone's like super sick and i think his latest album was like you know borderland country and just like all the acoustic guitars and it's i think it's super cool so um yeah post uh, malone is just he's like in his own world yeah he doesn't really care about that but yeah yeah um i guess yeah i kind of wanted to talk to you more about the first i guess i think it's the first single that has the yeah. yeah i think that one's really cool yeah, it was uh, it was actually probably the first or second song that I wrote where I was like, oh, I wouldn't die if somebody heard this. Because <laughs> like for like the longest time, I was like, no, like no one can hear this. No one can hear this. And then I wrote that one and I was like listening back in my car and I was like, OK, like I'd 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 put this out. Um, and that took a long time to get to. Again, it was like months and months and months, maybe even a year of, of writing and not thinking it was good enough. Uh, but just kind of like kept hacking away at it. And um, I think I had that guitar chord progression and wrote a song to it that was like kind of whatever. And then I actually remember I was driving and that the main chorus melody came to me and I just started recording it on a voice note and was like, okay, I have to like build the song around that. And then had that chorus and again wrote it on acoustic guitar and just got like refined that chorus melody and then built the song around that and started to like shape what I wanted to say about it's it's a you know it's kind of about a relationship like if you were to leave me what like what would I be without this person but it's also I think a lot for me about like what would I be kind of on my own even in the band context of like it is one of the first songs I wrote outside of the band and I'd wrote like plenty of songs by myself in the band, but like singing on it and putting it out under my name, like this is the Tom LaFleur single. It's like, that was a lot of pressure even for me to be like, okay, this is me doing it on my own. And so like, yeah, just who are you without that person or without that support group or like in this new phase of your life? And I tried to like capture that, um, in that, in that song. Well, I think you captured it well. Yeah. Sometimes I listen back, I'm like, damn, this is kind of sad. <laughs> and then I'm like, but I was sad then. So, yeah, it's okay. Yeah. Um, And I guess um, 
kind of going off of that, and you mentioned uh, a lot of the anxieties that you can get as a um, songwriter, what advice would you give to maybe not just songwriters, but other creatives to kind of combat that anxiety and still create? I think like the biggest thing is that it's almost like the game within the game of like everyone will tell you you have to write great songs and like the kind of way to get there is by writing a lot of songs. But it's like, how do you convince yourself to write a lot of songs? Is it like, do you just love it enough to write three songs every morning or do you start second guessing yourself for like this song is good enough, whatever. And like, for me, I think I had this, the bar was set so high. I was like, oh, again, I was listening to like all these artists with like hundreds of millions of streams, like world touring artists and being like, oh, this song that I wrote in my bedroom doesn't sound like that. And it's like, you have to like rewind and zoom out a little bit and be like, okay, this is like your third song that you've wrote. It's like your production doesn't sound as good. Like your lyrics aren't going to be as good, but it's like neither was their first or third song or whatever. And so you have to like really lower the bar to allow yourself to make music, but then have the high bar when it's like, you know, finally coming out time, time, time to like put it out or like do the visuals for it or like, you know, forming an album being like, this is what I want to say. You have to have a high bar and like an artistic vision for the whole thing. You can't just like throw whatever up. But in the music making process, you really have to like talk yourself off that ledge and be like, I'm just having fun. I'm just making like, a little jingle for no one that no one's gonna like it has to be there has to be no pressure on yourself um and again that just takes time and like your your first couple songs your first couple hundred songs like won't even be that good or they'll feel good in the moment and listen back like a week later and be like "Eh, it's not that good but that's just part of the process um so you just got to keep going yeah yeah and I honestly, that's kind of true for any creative because when you first start maybe writing in a capacity for music journalism or or a podcast or anything, you just kind of have to be like, well, I have to put it out there to get anywhere, but it can be scary because it's, it's, it's a lot. (laughs) Um, I guess, oh, this, I think this one would be great. What fictional character would you think would identify with like this new era of yours or just like aesthetic for the record? Which fictional character? Okay. Wow. (laughs) I don't know. For some reason, for for some reason, Jimmy Neutron was like the first name that just jumped in my head, but I don't even know if I can like defend that answer. (laughs) I don't know why. Um, which fictional character? I don't know. Maybe, maybe let, let me circle back on that one. Uh, if, if, I'll try to think of something by the end of the interview. Um, I guess we, I don't know if we kind of answered this earlier, but um, I guess where do you normally draw inspiration from when you're like songwriting yeah, that's a good one. Um, definitely, like, obviously my own life um, and what I'm going through, it's kind of impossible to not just inject that into, like, the songs that you're writing and what you're thinking about being like, oh, I'm worried about this or, like, this is exciting for me or, like, you know, running back something that happened. Like, oh, what if I did something different or, like, what would happen? It's like whatever you're kind of general normal operating (laughs) thoughts are those just like always end up on the songs but um i also try to write more just about like the the lyrics that always resonated with me as a kid were stuff like pink floyd where they would just be commenting on just life in general and like kind of more broader topics of like in commentary on like you know social things early adulthood like growing up finding your place in the world like just kind of a little bit more intellectual and 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 indifferent than like a relationship um again inevitably it's like you write about what you're going through so like there's definitely some kind of love songs on the record and there's definitely some songs that are like me even being like okay like there's one song called like it's okay that i'm just like 
it's like a, almost like a letter to myself being like it's okay like to take a day off and just like calm down dude like it's okay like that's like what that song is literally about um and again like it, you're just finding inspiration from what you're going through and trying to translate that into something that's like you hope that other people will resonate with yeah and um i i to kind of touch back on um your youth and childhood do you uh what is kind of like the earliest musical memory that you can think of yeah i actually i have a definite answer for that because i remember um when i first picked up the guitar like i was only like a couple months into it and my dad played me over the hills and far away by led zeppelin it's like a pretty intricate guitar part and i was like this is so cool and i like worked with my guitar teacher and like learned the song and practiced it for like months to get it down. And again, I'm like pretty early on. So like, this was like a huge jump for me and uh, finally played it for my dad. And I thought he was going to be so stoked. And he's like, yeah, you kind of got it. But like, listen how clean Jimmy Page plays it. Like, it's like, you can hear all the notes individually. And I was like, what? I was like, yeah, I'm like 10. And, but like, it also was like, okay, I'm going to like, I'm going to go get it. And so I just remember like hammering it out on that song just to get it down. And uh, that's probably my earliest musical memory. And then later I was just like practicing five hours a day, like insane, like every single day I'd get home from school and then just play guitar for like four or five hours. And then I started getting into like Stevie Ray Vaughan and Eddie Van Halen and like even some more like, yeah, like 80s, like kind of shredding stuff. And when you're trying to com- get that, like you just, you get your chops up, you get pretty fast, especially as a kid with nothing to do besides play guitar. Like, um, and then now I've kind of come full circle where it's like, I, I definitely am not like a shredder anymore, but I like to think I'm a little bit more melodic and thoughtful and all that. <laughs> but uh, yeah, as a kid, it was like, all I wanted to do was be Jimmy Page. <laughs> like everybody else that plays yeah. guitar. They have that one guitar hero that they all want exactly. to be. Exactly. Everyone has a guitar hero. And it's funny too, because I feel like you can trace who is whose guitar hero. Like when I see John Mayer play, I'm like, oh, he grew up with like Eric Clapton and Stevie Ray Vaughan and like the whole like Stratocaster like family line of like Jimi Hendrix, Eric Clapton, Stevie Ray Vaughan, all of that. And then you see somebody else play and you're like, I don't even try to think of like, like Slash. And you're like, okay, he's like on a list. He's like, he, he listened to Jimmy Page, you know, it's just like, you can, it's almost like divided by a couple family lines, but you can just tell like the modern guitarists who they grew up playing with or whatever. And if you saw me play in the band, like I was, you would have definitely noticed the Jimmy Page stuff. I was playing a Les Paul, like just the licks I was playing were like very inspired by that like i was definitely in that line and now i feel like i'm kind of just like in the middle where you know it's kind of hard to sound like jimmy page on a lo-fi indie pop bedroom song so it's like i'm not like ripping some distorted blues solo but it's still like deep in the dna somewhere you know you know Mm mm-hmm I'm always in awe of like the guitars because I'm learning right now to play myself and it's, it's insane how fast and that people can learn all the licks and the, and the melodies and the notes and stuff. Yeah. And I, and I only have, I'm only playing on get, acoustic guitar, but I'm having fun. So I'm not going to be on stage writing anytime soon, but it, it's, it's, um it's fun to just kind of learn and, yeah. and stuff. Yeah. Like- no, it- and I think if you chase the fun, you'll you'll get good because there were so many like people I remember from growing up that were forced to play maybe things they didn't want to play or like learn scales. And it's like, if you're not excited about it, you probably won't do it for that long. But if you're like learning like your favorite song on the radio right now, and then you like learn to play it on guitar, it's like that excitement fuels like the extra reps and you'll play for three hours to get it. And then like one day you'll wake up and you're like kind of good. And you're like, oh, I didn't see what happened. It was just like, because it was fun the whole time, you know? Yeah, because I've noticed that, because I've only been playing for like um, a few months now. Yeah. And I've noticed my the difference from when I first started to now. 
And so you are correct about how it, if you're not enjoying it, then you're not going to get anywhere, especially being older, trying to play. Yeah. Cause you're, it's, you're, it's, you're not going to like rewire your brain as fast as when you were like five or whatever, but you can still definitely learn anything. Like, yeah, even for me singing on the, the first song and the, and the whole record, like I wasn't singing on any of the band songs. Um, uh, and I kind of just had to like hack away at it and like teach myself how to sing. Cause like, what was the other option? Like, I just wouldn't, I mean, I'm going to have to make music. So I have to like, I have to start singing on this. And I was like, Oh shit, I got to like get better at this. Um, and again, it's just reps. It's just the game within the game of like, is it fun? Do you set yourself up to like, you know, if you have to practice guitar at five thirty every morning and it's not fun, you're probably not going to play that much. But if you like have the afternoon to play and it's fun, It'll get good, you know. Good, you know. Hmm, I would agree. Yeah, and I guess my uh, next question would be: What three words would you use to define your artistic self? I want to say like innocent or childlike. I'm maybe innocent's a better word, but there definitely is like a return to this like freedom that I felt as a child when I I, I just lowered the bar again, where it's just like it doesn't matter, and I and I could just have fun making the music. Um, and I don't even know if this batch of songs coming out is the best representation of that because I was pretty hard on myself during that time. But like even more recently, I'm just trying to like lean into the fun of it, which is again the reason that like anyone does anything. Um, so I would say like innocent, um, I don't know if this is even the best word, but like polished in the sense of I like the kind of like clean aesthetic of and like polished sound of like modern expensive records. But I also like the, the intimacy of like a lot of lo-fi records and like when it like feels like you're in their bedroom kind of vibe and like it, like you hear like scratches and yeah, you just you hear all like the hiss of the amp and like, it sounds like they recorded it for $5 off their iPhone, but then, I also like, you know, like a Frank Ocean record that sounds like it was like a million dollar record. So I feel like polished in the sense of taking the lo-fi, like intimacy and the innocence and the ener- and that energy, but then making it sound pro within my limitations too. Cause I'm not, you know, like the best producer on the planet. And if I was, I maybe would produce it and it'd be too good sounding. Like it doesn't sound like Despacito or Peaches or something. It sounds like something in the middle where it's it sounds good but it doesn't sound perfect um so i feel like polished is like kind of the is like the aesthetic i'm going for but i can't even quite get to which is kind of a good middle ground um and then i guess bedroom which is kind of a cop because i already said that but like bedroom in the sense of that's where it was all written and recorded. And I feel like that informs the music so much because it really does. Like when I'm in my bedroom, like I'm just going to sing a little quieter. Like I'm going to probably like sing more introspective thoughts. You know, it's just like everything just informs room, like the guitar. I'm even like plucking a little quieter. Like there's electric, there's electric guitar parts, but like the amp was really quiet. So it's like, I feel like that even like kind of comes across where it's like, this very intimate bedroom feeling to it. Um, as opposed to like, sometimes if you're in a big studio, you can like make it sound anthemic and you know, there's obviously exceptions to all that, but I just feel like the bedroom really did contribute to it. And it like truly is like an indie bedroom pop. Yeah. Record, you know? And a lot of those, um, the noises that you were, you were mentioning, you hear a lot on the old school sounds and records because of the way that they made them was a lot of, it's like an analog uh, yeah, when they were totally. recording on the analog t- um, recorder and tapes and stuff. And they take that out now because everything is with um, electronic and stuff. So yeah, it is. They make, yeah, yeah. They, they make it, they make it super, make it super clean. clean, which is cool. Um, but it just depends on the record. So like, again, on a Justin Bieber, like Despacito, Peaches, what it, like, you know, all the big records. It's like, you probably want it to sound perfect and you want like there to be no air and you want it to just like hit at all the right points and then you hear like i'm trying to think of like a big kind of lo-fi record but like there's yeah there's so many like 
I would say medium, medium big artists um, that have this sweet spot of like capturing that energy where it's like there's like hiss in the air. It's like there's a bird chirping. There's a squeak on the guitar. There's like a chair that moves and like that just places you in a different headspace to listen to it where you're like, oh, this is like this was this really happened or something. I don't know. Yeah, especially if you have like a really good uh, set of uh, headphones, you can really hear it. Um, and I know on, um, on the new Olivia Rodrigo record, and I forgot which song on there, but, oh, may have been Lacey on, on there. You can hear like the, the pops and the hisses too on some of her, on the songs. So I guess it just kind of depends on what feeling, like you said, they go for and things like that. So I guess maybe some artists, it depends. They, they still kind of, um. They use they they keep certain things in the, and they use it for effect. So yeah, um, what is something that you learned early on in your career that is um, helping you now as a solo artist? Okay, um, I mean, there's so many like little things I can think of in terms of you know music making and production and songwriting and like general approach, but one of the big things that I'd probably want to highlight is that like, I feel like no, you no no one's going to do anything for you <laughs> at any point. And like, I think as I was younger, people would come in, they'd be excited about the band, like, you know, labels, managers, agents, other producers, songwriters, other bands that like, it could be any form. And they'd be like, Oh, I'll do this for you. Or like, you know, send me your music and I'll like get you in front of this person. It's like the first like a hundred times I heard that I was like, Oh my God, this person's going to change our lives. Like we played a show and this guy would come up to us after and be like, I know this like agent who, you know, is Muse's agent. Like you guys could open for Muse. And like, I'd go to bed being like, Oh my God, like this is going to be it. Like we're going to open for, it's like nothing ever pans out. No one does anything for you. Like you have to do it yourself kind of thing. And even with our like label, it's like, I thought when we signed to Universal that they would just take care of everything. Like, you know, they, we'd get money and that we like, they would take care of, you know, everything from like touring to like making the tour poster to like, what all, I thought they would just like shelter us from everything. We just have to like make music and be a good band, but it's like nothing changed. It's like, we still did everything. We still did all of the social media, like all of the, like just everything was still on our shoulders and I feel like just taking that to what I'm doing now it's like I just know that I have to do everything so it's like it's just like a different frame of mind where I'm like somebody's like oh like this sounds great I can help you with this I'm like sure that's great like you can add whatever you want to what I'm doing but I'm not deviating from my path and I'm not gonna like slow down and not take an opportunity or I'm not gonna I'm not gonna think about what I'm doing here because someone else is going to do that for me. It's like, I feel like I have a hundred percent ownership over like quite literally every area of what I'm doing. And I don't think I would have had that if I hadn't gotten like numb to the idea of just like people promising stuff. So I feel like I just learned that, you know, kind of early on. And now I just like, I just know I have to like, I'll edit all the photos and edit all the videos and record myself and write and place it. Just like every step of the way, you have to be like pretty good at everything. Yeah. Uh, you know, I I would the reason why I I would agree with you is because I'm doing everything for my I I don't really call it a brand, but for with my blog and then my podcast and all that, I'm doing everything. So I understand that. Like, and there's so many. Like- there's so many like skills that you have to have in order to just like launch anything. You have to be good at like there's so many like yeah, you know, like graphic design and like copywriting. Mm-hmm. It's, just, like, it's like so many things. Yeah, I, the, honestly, at a certain point, maybe you might can hire on people, but then when you hire on people, you have to make sure that they're doing what they're supposed to be doing right. And to me, that's a little scary. But oh, totally. yeah. Um, yeah, I guess you don't mind talking about Halloween, do you? Okay. Um, so do you have any plans for Halloween? Not yet, but there's this haunted house at the end of my street that's being built right now. So that'll definitely be on the list. But, um, 
I don't know. I'll probably come up with a costume like three hours before a party and then pull it together and go <laughs> just to get out and do something fun. But um, no, I don't have any uh, Halloween costumes or plans yet. My best Halloween costume, I was Jon Snow one year when Game of Thrones was huge. Yeah, I like I had it down. <laughs> I had the beard and the curly hair and everything. It was good. good. Yeah, I, I, that one I can see. Um, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and then I guess another one to kind of still go with the Halloween. Um, do you have any favorite Halloween theme movies or scary movies? I'm not really a scary movie guy. I, I get scared so easily. Um, I'm trying to think if they're like, I actually, I actually like silence of the lambs. Um, like there's like a couple good classic movies like that, but, um, it's funny, like, I have this group of friends right now that's, like, trying to go to a a scary, like, haunted house experience thing on the Friday. I'm just like, no, I do not want to go to that. <laughs> I do not like, I do not like getting scared, yeah. But I, I for me, it depends on what type of movie it is. Um, some movies I'm just not going to watch. I won't watch, like, The Exorcist at all. Okay. Not watching Rosemary's Baby. I've seen The Omen, but I don't know. Um, I, can't even, I, yeah. I can't even watch the trailers. Like if it comes on TV, I like I'm like a child. I plug my ears and look down. I'm like I don't need this. I don't need this energy. <laughs> yeah, I prefer older movies anyway. When it comes to like horror films, stuff like, like that. More scary movies. Yeah, when it comes to well, just in general, but yeah, yeah. But I'm I'm a bit of a scaredy cat too. Well, I guess kind of what just want to ask you that um, what is next on the horizon for you, and just kind of want to so we can tell your the fans and and see what just kind of what is yeah what you have coming up. Yeah. So. Um, yeah. So um, I have that first song I put out. Man, that was beginning of September. I have my second single coming out this Friday, so October 6th. And then I'm going to do another single a month after that, so November, whatever it is, 7th or 8th. Um, and then I'm going to put out my like first album. I don't know if I'm calling it an EP or album yet because it's probably like seven or eight songs. But that will come out mid-November, so like maybe two weeks after that next single. Um, and that'll be like a good just ground level of like what Tom LaFleur is on like a very like aesthetic level of just, this is like the kind of sounds I like, this is the kind of songwriting it is. And like, I feel like for me, that's a big relief to be like, okay, this is like the beginning of my artist footprint where it's like, this is, you know, chapter one, like that's what I feel good about right now. And then I'm already writing for like what would be the next album um, like, you know, chapter two or whatever, which would start in my mind, like in my ideal world, I'd start releasing singles for that January. So like January, February, March, drop that next album, which is already kind of leaning like, definitely, I would not say the weekend, but like a little bit more, even like distorted tuned vocals, like a little bit more um, like hip hop drums on some things but like still all of like the lo-fi jazzy guitar stuff and I kind of want to like lean into that like I would almost say like darkness energy that I'm getting from that it's like uh and even some of the productions like maybe a little bit like Kanye E or something I don't know and I want to like double down on that and do that January February March and maybe release like eight or nine songs in that window and then while I'm writing that, I'll probably be inspired by the next thing. But like, I definitely want to release a song every single month through the end of this year and the next year. And like, honestly, maybe like three albums. Like, I just want to put out a bunch of music because um, I feel like I've just been kind of like held back to for so long that now it's exciting for me to be like out of the gates just putting out music. So that's amazing because when someone can just write and keep writing and finally get all that creative energy out that's that's really good so i'm congrats on that yeah thank you yes and my last question is is there anything that i didn't ask um that maybe i should have asked 
Actually, I don't think so. At least not off the top of my head. Well, uh, it was really great speaking with you, and I really wish you the best of luck and everything on your musical uh, path and everything. Love the first song. Awesome. Thank you. Yeah, check out the one on Friday. It's coming out in, what is that, three days? Yeah, it's exciting. But um, yeah, thank you. That was, uh, that was awesome. You asked great questions, and I wish I had a better answer for the fictional character, but maybe something will come to me and I'll, I'll send it to you. <laughs>